All right, everybody, thank you for coming out uh, to my talk today. Uh, I'm Noah Watkins, and I'm an engineer at Red Hat. I work primarily on, on Rook, um, Ceph orchestration. Um, but today I'm going to talk about something completely different. I'm going to talk about extending Ceph, uh, extending uh, functionality for your application. So this is a picture of uh, the Ceph architecture. I'm going to use this picture throughout uh, the talk, so it's worth two seconds describing it. There's clients accessing the cluster below through a variety of APIs like Rados or RBD. Uh, this talk is primarily going to focus on access uh, to the system through the lower level Rados API. Um, but before we get started with that, I just want to spend one second talking about RBD. So have you ever wondered about how RBD LS works? Um, for those of you who don't know, RBD is the, the block device uh, feature in Ceph. And RBD LS will list out the set of images that Ceph is managing, on, uh, is managing for you. Um, it's worth asking where this data is stored, where this information about all the images is stored. Because when you install Ceph or you've listened to talks about Ceph, nobody's ever discussing the installation of a database. Um, there's a bunch of examples of metadata in the system. Uh, that are like this. So there's snapshots and clones in RBD, or all the listings of the objects in RGW uh, buckets. Um, and a reasonable answer to this is that Ceph stores that data uh, in objects. After all, Ceph's an object store. But if you've ever tried to build uh, any sort of data management for structured data on top of objects that store binary data, you will have realized that that is a gigantic headache. But it turns out that Ceph does store all of this data, all the structured data in objects. Um, but it takes an approach by building application-specific interfaces on top of these objects. So in addition to having your standard binary CRUD-type interfaces to these objects, um, each object can store data specifically for RGW or specific for RBD. And those interfaces are designed specifically for those applications. And this talk is going to describe to you how you can go about taking advantage um, of features in Ceph to build your own application-specific interfaces. So the rest of this talk uh, I'm gonna, is going to be like this. I'm going to tell you about a very simple Rados client application. This is going to mostly be a driver for the rest of the, the talk. I'm going to extend Ceph to provide functionality to this example. Um, and then I'm going to uh, give you some motivating examples uh, that maybe kind of get you more interested in this technology, some resources. And then I'm going to show you how to build these in Lua, which has some certain advantages over C++. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so let's talk about a Libratos example. I'm going to build this up uh, pretty quickly. Libratos is an API for accessing the low-level uh, object interface. Um, for those of you who don't, don't use Libratos um, or know much about it, it's different than the objects that we talk about when we talk about RGD, RGW objects. Um, some of the differences are that Rados objects have maximum sizes. It ha they have different mutability properties. You don't access Libratos through HTTP. You access it through lower level uh, interfaces. Um, and there's a bunch of different you know, differences between these, uh, these interfaces. Um, but what you get by using Libratos is a very rich API um, and lots of functionality that can give you better performance when your application is able to take advantage of this. The example we're going to build up is an example where uh, a client reads up an object and uh, performs a checksum on that object. So not too complicated. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, um, but I, I'm going to walk through the code. It's, it's pretty simple. I've included some resources here if you're more interested in building Libratos applications. Uh, so I'll, I'll, these slides are available, I believe, online, so you can, so you can get them. So when we talk about Libratos applications, what we're talking about are clients accessing the OSDs and the objects managed by those OSDs directly. So instead of going through these intermediate layers like RGW or RBD. Rados contains a very rich set of APIs. So you can do a lot with this, uh, with this interface. So you can store structured key value data. Uh, you, can, you can get notifications for when objects change. You can combine different uh, um, operations, and Ceph will execute those atomically on your behalf. But if all of these things don't um, get you what you need for your application, you can go ahead and extend 
uh, this set of interfaces. What we mean by extensions is that you're actually building code. You're write writing code and compiling it into an object and inserting that into the OSDs dynamically. And this technology is referred to as object classes. So let's look and see an example of an application that might be able to take advantage of something like this. So this code snippet over here is um, the, the example where we read an object and we take a checksum of it. First thing we do is we connect to the cluster and open an I.O. context for a pool. Um, then we read the data back into the heap, into a buffer list, which is really just a, um, it's an object that does uh, memory management for you. Um, but after you've read, it, re read the data, it's in the heap. And so you can go ahead and apply that, um, apply the MD5 sum function to this data and use the local uh, CPU resources on your client to, um, uh, to compute that, that answer. Um, so it's worth noting here that this is a very typical pattern, right? So Ceph doesn't do everything for you. For example, it doesn't compute MD5 sums for you. Um, but it could be to the advantage of an application writer to actually do this remotely. So maybe your objects are really large or you want to compute the sum of, a, of a, a large amount of objects, being able to do that remotely on the OSDs may provide you with some performance benefits. So let's look and see what this example would look like if Ceph actually provided such functionality. So again, we'd connect to the cluster. But instead of reading the data and computing that hash function uh, locally on the client, what we would instead like to do is invoke a remote function that's been injected into the system. So at the bottom here is an example where we are um, uh, executing um, at the MD5 function, um, uh, and we're applying it to this object named object. And so the CPU resources on the OSD are used to perform all of that work, and only the, the result is returned to the client. So if we look at our example again, now we're actually writing code. We're putting code into this, uh, into this module. And we're going to look in detail about how to actually build these and how to code them. So um, in this section, we're going we're to actually develop that, that object class. And I'm going to walk you through that code. So on the right here, or sorry, on the left here is a, is a CLS checksum.cc. This is a, um, a C++ file that we're going to compile and insert into the server. This is what contains the functionality that's going to implement our new MD5 method. On the client side, or over here on the right, is um, the exact code we were just looking at. So at the bottom is the invocation uh, of this method on behalf of the client. So let's, let's walk through the code for computing the MD5 sum. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to receive an input from the client. So when the client invokes this method, it's going to stuff whatever data it, it wants to send to the instance of this method executing on the server. And Ceph will arrange for that data to arrive um, when this code is executed. Uh, we're not going to use the input here in this example, but we're going to use it later in another example. The next thing we do is we're going to take uh, a stat of the object um, to get the size. So we want to read the whole object. We need to know how big it is. You'll notice here that um, we're not invoking stat on a particular object. And this is something that's interesting about developing object classes is that the object that the method is being applied to is implicit. It's based on whatever the client had requested. So in this case, there's an object named object. When an instance of this code runs on the server, it's going to be invoked on whatever the object the client requested. Um, after that, it's, uh, it's, it's basically the same as our example before. We read the data up into the heap. We apply the MD5 sum. And then we, uh, we um, insert the result into this output variable. And again, just like the input, Ceph is going to take uh, care of all the details involved in networking and marshalling and failover to make sure that output arrives back at the client. Um, so this is basically all there is to it, to building object classes. Of course, they can become much more complex, um, and they often are. Uh, the only thing left to do is a little boilerplate. So when you're developing these object classes, you need to include a header, compile in some metadata, um, and then you need to provide some code that will register uh, this object class when it's dynamically inserted into um, the running OSD. Um, the two pieces here that are important are that you're registering a name um, really for the module, so kind of like a grouping of methods. Um, and then the method itself, 
here, it's called MD5. These are the strings you use on the client on the right to um, specify what method should be invoked. Um, and then the only other thing to mention is that you provide um, uh, some flags here to say whether or not your method is read-only or maybe it does read-write. And those are used to optimize execution. So there's a lot of uh, interfaces you can use within these object class implementations. We saw stat and, and read. Um, but you can interact with the byte stream or extended attributes or OMAP. And you can do various other things, um, like examine the context of the clients that are connected. Um, and there's uh, some resources at the end of the talk. You can, you can refer to those for finding out um, what the full scope of these, this API is. Um, so to be able to make use of these object classes, we need, to, we need to compile and insert them. So this is a snippet here. This is all you need to build, um, build an object class to insert into Ceph is this CMake snippet. You could also compile it directly with GCC. Um, after you've compiled this, it's going to create a file, a shared object file called libcls.checksum.so. Um, and then you're going to place this file into a particular directory, depending on your Linux distribution. And then Ceph will search for this file and load it dynamically for you. There's a couple ways to go about managing this code. So the first is that you can, um, you can, uh, you can add your code to the Ceph tree itself. Um, so this would be good if you're trying to take some common functionality that you want to move upstream and make available to everyone. Um, and in this case, you just place your code into a particular directory in the tree, update the CMake file, and then there's a, 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 a header file you use that's, um, that's specific to the Ceph source tree layout. You can also build your image or your, your modules outside the Ceph tree. In this case, you install this SDK package, which just includes a, um, a header file here. So um, same functionality, just a different, uh, a different header. Um, the final thing that you need to do is you need to whitelist your, your module. So uh, modules like RGD, RGW and RBD, these are already whitelisted. Um, but sort of for obvious reasons, you don't want to just be able to load any sort of random binary. So you need to, to fix these security issues uh, and, and whitelist your module. And so that's basically it. Um, I want to talk now about a couple examples just to give you a sense for kind of the scope of things that people are using this technology for. So I want to talk briefly about a project called Skyhook. This comes out of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, this is an elastic database engine that's being built on top of Ceph. Um, and it's currently being uh, developed by Jeff LeFevre. Um, the basic idea behind Skyhook is that relational tables are partitioned um, along, uh, well, well, it uses row partitioning. Um, and then these partitions are added into objects within a Ceph cluster. Since it's a storage engine, uh, different database, database engines can run on top of it. So here's an example where Postgres is communicating to, the, to Ceph through the storage interface um, uh, called Skyhook. And this interface presents um, a logically a concatenated view of all these table partitions, um, and then presents a set of methods over those partitions. Um, and the set of methods that are implemented by object classes in Skyhook um, are things that are amenable to using the resources in the system. So predicate evaluation. So for example, like a where clause on your SQL statement can be pushed down into the system. Uh, you can do things like projection, uh, which is you know, returning only the set of columns that you care about. Um, and then there's a bunch of other ways that Skyhook accelerates queries using those uh, storage system resources. So I can show you a couple examples of the performance that you get if you're able to make use of this type of uh, processing. This is execution time for a query that's selecting 10% of a billion rows. Um, and then we're, we're um, increasing the number of, of OSDs. The blue bar is uh, execution time when we move the whole data set back to the client. So this would be in a, like a baseline where you don't have uh, an intelligent interface. And then the red is where we're doing the filtering inside of Ceph. Um, and I don't want to go over all these details. Just here at the end, we, we observe a 6x performance increase um, by making use of uh, those, those remote resources and not moving all of that data back over the network. Um, 
the next example of a performance improvement is a point query. So this is, um, this is like a primary key query where you're looking for one row, in this case, one row in a billion rows. Um, the blue and the red uh, are the same uh, style of execution that we saw in the previous one where we're scanning the whole data set. Um, but the thing to note here um, is that uh, we also build indexes over all the rows that are stored in these partitions. Um, and we can query these, uh, these indexes in parallel. So we do one lookup per partition, uh, and we can find that row that we care about. And we can do it in about 100x faster than moving all that data back to the client. So Jeff is using uh, this result really as a basis for a lot of the cool stuff he's doing with uh, database engine acceleration uh, on top of Ceph. So I encourage you to look at that in more detail if, if uh, it's interesting to you. Um, the, the second example sort of, of more of a resource for you if you're interested in developing object classes is Ceph itself. So this is a directory listing of the Ceph source tree. It's my favorite directory in Ceph. Uh, it contains all the object classes. Uh, and uh, you can like go shopping in this directory. So there's a ton of examples in here. So you can, you can find design patterns for atomics or numeric operations different flavors of concurrency control. There's a bunch of stuff in here. In fact, there's, uh, like, there's over 200 methods here that you can go peruse and look for, for interesting things to, to help you uh, in your, your development process. The one I want to focus on here is the Lua directory. So this is an object class that we've implemented uh, that allows you to build all of the functionality we've discussed so far, but do that in Lua in, in, instead of um, instead of C++. So let's look at this diagram again. Um, before we were inserting C++, compiled C++ into the OSDs, there's a lot of challenges here, especially related to security that I mentioned before. But there's also some other problems with C++ that you might encounter. So the first is that you may, if you're doing this as a plugin, like outside of the Ceph tree, you're going to have to deal with versioning these uh, modules. You're going to have to deal with um, distributing them to your to your nodes or to your containers. Um, updating uh, the object classes mean you need to restart your OSDs, and that can be disruptive. <coughs> um, and finally, if you, um, you have an application that might want to dynamically generate uh, its own interfaces, then this, these are sort of roadblocks to being able to have an, ad an agile development process there. So what we've done is we've, we've simply put the Lua VM into the OSDs and then um, provided mechanisms for injecting uh, Lua code uh, into the system dynamically. <clears throat> so we can look at our example again. So this is the same example we saw before of computing MD5 sum of a, an object. We read the object. We compute the result and return it to the client. This is the equivalent code for doing that in Lua. So it reads exactly the same. You, you read the object, then you compute the result and send it back. Um, but what's interesting here is that this, this is really equivalent. And uh, the semantics of this are equivalent, including the air handling. Um, and that's really quite a powerful um, feature of, of doing this in Lua. So one thing that you'll encounter when you're building object classes is that air handling, uh, you really have to get that, you have to get it perfect. So it's not just about whether or not an OSD crashes, for example, but it's really about correctness. Like if, you, if you're reporting success to your client, then, but it actually failed, it may think data exists that doesn't. You could break referential integrity by not getting um, the, uh, the uh, air handling correct. So we've gone ahead and we've codified in the bindings for Lua many of the air handling patterns that you find in object classes, and we, we do that. We, we implement those patterns transparently for you. Of course, you can, you can circumvent these if you need to, and we'll see uh, in the next example why you might want to circumvent those. <clears throat> so that's also available. So how do you invoke this? We, you know, now we have like this client, which is logically doing one thing, but written in two different languages. So we need to resolve that issue. Uh, this is the full example. So we connect to the cluster and get our IO context. Um, since Lua can just be encoded as a string, uh, we can do that in C++ as well, especially this new like syntax with modern C++ makes it pretty nice. Um, 
And then you can register as many of these methods in, in the string, or maybe you put it in a file and read it up. And then you go ahead and invoke it. And the invocation, you'll notice, is really exactly the same as before. We're just using a, a, a library that can wrap the protocol. Uh, and then we're providing the script that's going to contain the implementations. <clears throat> so this is all in Ceph now. You can, you can go ahead and use it today. Um, there's quite a bit of API coverage um, for all the object class uh, API. I don't think all of it's there, but um, that's not fundamental. That can be expanded if you find uh, that it's, it's lacking something you'd like. Um, the C and C++ APIs for interacting with this are efficient, so they do native uh, Ceph encoding. Um, but if you want to use libraries, uh, Rados libraries like Python or Go, for example, there's also a JSON protocol that you can use, but it, it's, uh, you, know, you have to encode that input data, so it could be less efficient. Um, uh, you know, but it, 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 we make that available. Um, and again, here you need to deal with security, so you need to whitelist the Lua module. You don't need to whitelist all the functions within it. Um, and that's basically, that's basically it for the Lua stuff. I want to walk through one more example, which, um, uh, which is a little more complex. Um, so this example is going to perform uh, thumbnail generation over images stored in Ceph. So you could imagine like a web server that's trying to you know, create a thumbnail, a very large like raw image or something, and you don't want to move all that over the network and do that computation uh, in your web server. Uh, so the, on the right is the object, um, and it just contains uh, whatever raw image we're using as the source for our thumbnail generation. We're going to read that object up, uh, and then we're going to load it into image magic that we've, we've included here. Um, and then we're going to take the input from the client. So the input here coming in from the client is a specification for the thumbnail. And this specification is a string. Its format is specific to image magic. Um, it's, I think it's just uh, you know, width by height or something like this. We compute the thumbnail, and then we go ahead and return that binary back to the client. Um, so we're using those remote resources to do that generation for us. Um, but we can go ahead and uh, improve this. So we can, we can improve this example by caching the thumbnails. You could imagine that a, a web server requests the same size thumbnail over and over again. So we can go ahead and, and uh, avoid all that recomputation. Um, so this is the example, uh, all the code you would need to do that. And on the right is the new uh, format of the object. So I'm going to walk through that first. Um, at the top, we're using the key value database. Uh, I believe here we're using OMAP. Um, and this is going to store metadata. So you can see that there's a row per each uh, uh, specification. So there's the original, then there's a spec for each thumbnail, and then the offset and length where you can find that thumbnail and image inside the object. Um, so the first thing we're going to do when we are executing our method um, is we're going to look to see if the spec we're looking for is in the table. Um, and you can see here we are using pcall to intercept the, the error return codes. And in this case, what we care about is whether or not uh, that spec is present. Um, and in particular, if it's not present, we're going to go ahead and um, get the location of the original image, because we need to compute that thumbnail. It doesn't exist. And we're going to set this flag build thumb equal true. Um, then uh, the next step is to read up the image. So that's going to either be the original or it's going to be the thumbnail if we happen to find it. And if it's the thumbnail, um, we're going to just return it directly back to the client. Um, otherwise, we need to go ahead and compute the thumbnail. So exactly the same as before, load it into image magic, compute the, the image. But this time, we're actually going to go ahead and save the image back into the object. Um, and this example illustrates something really powerful about object class development is that Ceph will execute these functions atomically for you. Uh, and what that means is that either all fails or all succeeds. And this is critical for maintaining um, references between pieces of data. So in this case, you wouldn't want to, say, write your thumbnail but have the metadata update fail. You'd, you, it would effectively be like a leak of data, right? So, um, so that's really great. So after you update this, uh, you go ahead and send it back to the client, and, and you're all done. 
Um, so, okay, so, you know, what I've shown you so far is uh, thumbnail generation, uh, checksum calculation. These are pretty, uh, these are, you know, useful examples and they're also easy to explain, but you could imagine that you're taking advantage of this for all kinds of different things that your applications might do. Um, you could imagine that you put a web server in front of it or you use this for different uh, serverless applications. There's a lot of possibilities in, uh, uh, in this technology. So wrapping up, I just want to point out a couple more use cases that are currently being developed that I was able to, to find. Um, these should be coming online probably sometime this year, I think. Um, the first is, um, uh, is an object class that's going to implement IOS IO slicing or something like this for multidimensional data in HDF5. So you can go in and you can request um, different subsets of uh, the multidimensional data stored in HDF5 and then do that efficiently. Um, I think they're going to have some amount of computation there, but I'm not totally clear on how much. Um, the second example is uh, Root, which is a storage system used in high energy physics. Um, this is going to be there, well, Root has been around for a long time, but they're revamping parts of it, um, and they're trying to make use of object classes in Ceph uh, to deal with the coming data from the high, high luminosity uh, phase of LHC. Um, and then the last example is uh, really cool. They're using, uh, at Los Alamos, they're using LLVM to extract IO kernels. Um, and then they're going to push those down into Ceph. And what's interesting for, for, for us here is that they're going to be using WebAssembly. Um, and so I think that is actually something that you might see being done in parallel to Lua in the near future. Um, and this has a lot of benefits. So not only from performance benefits um, over Lua, um, but there's a lot of really compelling tool chains that exist around the WebAssembly technology that could make it uh, a viable alternative. Um, grab my slides if you're interested in this stuff. I've included here various resources that I've mentioned throughout the talk. Um, and then uh, that's it. So I'd be happy to take questions. I think we should have a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's no mics. I, my question is, uh, so this seems to run on the OSD level. Uh, would this work with something like PC pools, where your objects are broken up into pieces? Does it assemble it in one place? And oh, that's a good question. Um, I th well, somebody else could probably answer it. I don't think object classes work with erasure-coded pools. Or what? Yeah, so the question is, um, would uh, this technology work with erasure-coded pools? And I believe the answer is that um, object classes, uh, including the Lua object class, would not just, they're just not functional on top of the erasure coded pools right now. Yeah. Can you explain about the shipping mechanism for Lua? The, the what? The deployment mechanism. The deployment mechanism. So currently, the mechanism is that when you want to invoke a method, you have to ship the script uh, at the same time as you're invoking the method. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, so you have to ship it each time. You could imagine that you enhance this by caching the scripts on the servers. Um, there's also, there's, there's a patch available, but I don't think it's upstream right now, where you can um, deploy the Lewis scripts to the local file system and have them loaded up uh, like that. So I think that's a really cool way to, to do it as well. Yeah. I'll repeat it. Have you, have you looked at what HAProxy is doing for their Lua integration, specifically around a subset of non-blocking Lua? Uh, OK, so the question is, have I looked at HAProxy and HA how? HAProxy's Lua, Lua integration for non-blocking Lua. OK, Lua, their Lua integration for non No, I haven't. <laughs> but I'd be interested in seeing what they're doing. I mean, uh, yeah. It specifically adds non-blocking and a whole batch of security around making Safe things. Oh, that'd be great. So safety is one of the primary concerns there. Okay, cool. Let's chat. Any other questions? All right. I think that's it. Thank you.